When we were in Israel visiting the garden tomb, it was an overwhelming experience and not something that we can describe. To be the, at the site where death was defeated made it a very humbling but a very powerful day. And if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, don't wait. Just do it. There will always be an excuse not to go. But it will change the way you live your life forever. And it will change the way that you read this book forever. The, page was, will, the words on the page will just pop out at you. Especially during weeks like this, the Holy Week. But as I was looking over my notes of when we were in the garden tomb, three things stuck out to me that I believe every person, not just believers, but every person should know. And they're very powerful things. Number one, you are forgiven. No matter your sin, no matter the hardship, no matter your addiction, and no matter your condition, you have been forgiven. God said, come as you are. You cannot fix yourself and you cannot forgive yourself. You are just clay in the potter's hands, useless by itself. But when you come to Jesus, you are forgiven. And when you accept Jesus as your Savior, when you accept Him as your Messiah, and you accept Him as your personal and close friend, you are forgiven. Because every stripe that He took walking that path, every nail in His hand and feet, the crown of thorns on His head that was excruciating was for you. And every drop of blood that was shed on that path and on that day was there to wash you clean because He loves you and you are forgiven. And not only are you forgiven, but number two, you have power. What is this power? When you become a Christian, you have power. Because when Jesus was talking to His disciples the day that He was leaving, the last thing He said to them in Acts verse, um, chapter 1, verse 8, He says to them, When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. A power so strong that in Romans 8, it says that it's the same power that in the same spirit that rose Christ from the grave lives in you. That power is spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. That is Jesus' spirit. And Jesus told them that they need to wait until the, he sends his spirit. Because it is important to understand that Jesus was not sending them alone or by their own authority to preach. But he would still be with them in their ministry by his spirit. And by this, they would have the authority to do and say what Jesus did and said. And you have the same authority. He empowered them for life and ministry, and he's going to empower you for your life and everything that you face and your ministry. The power of God enables us to experience the reality of God and live in the supernatural. It transforms us. It helps us to pray to defeat the powers of darkness, sin, and temptation. The power that has overcome death and hell has been given to us to overcome sickness and disease and this, fire, and this virus. It's been given to us to help us battle against discouragement and disappointment, rejection and hurts, fear and intimidation, persecution and opposition. The power of God gives us the burden for the lost and a boldness to preach and teach and minister. It makes us effective witnesses for God and enables us to fulfill His call upon our life, freely giving what we freely receive from Him, as Matthew uh, 10 says. The power of God carries us through hardship and sufferings for the Master. It enables us to live a life that is pleasing to God, knowing that although we are in the world, we are not of this world. We must know that as Christians we have the power of God, only with the power can we lead a powerful Christian life and be an effective in our ministry is with that power. So you are forgiven and you have power. And number three, you are a witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea and Samaria and even the uttermost parts of the earth. Again, this is Jesus talking to his disciples the very last instruction that he said. This story does not suggest that every word in every conversation be about Jesus, but it does raise some meaningful questions for us to look at. Does our conversation reflect our love of Jesus? Do our words mirror the kind of relationship we have with him? Are we serious about sharing our story with others? 
In other words, what kind of witness are you when it comes to telling others about Jesus? Again, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we find Jesus giving his disciples and us his final instructions. He says, When you have received the power of the Holy Spirit, you will become my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. A witness is a person who tells what they have seen. Jesus said that we are to become the witnesses of what we, has happened to us. Our lives have changed and how others can be changed as well. Our work as a witness is to humbly, accurately tell others about the hope that we now have because Jesus is our friend. He's our Savior. He's our Messiah. You and I are not Christians because we are more intelligent or because we have more, uh, a better moral standard than anyone else. Because it's not true. We are Christians because of an undeserved, unearned, unmerited gift that we have uh, heard about and have accepted. We are Christians because we have been given better hope than all the hopes which the world gives. More people are on social media now more than ever before. More fear in this season has overtaken people than ever before. And it has been proven through history that during times of fear and uncertainty like we are living in now, people will look at the church again. So my question for you is, how are you being a witness this week? How are you telling everyone that Jesus is alive? And how are you going to spread the word that the grave is empty?